Welcome to the Riff Hard Podcast. We're going to do something a little bit different today. I know that we could just talk about guitar, which, you know, could do that any day, all day, all year. But what we're going to talk about today is, I think, just as relevant to almost all of you. Any of you who are trying to release music, put out music, have a music career as an artist, should pay attention to this episode. It's more of a panel than a single guest interview. We've got Mr. Jesse Cannon, who's an old friend and an old friend of URM. Uh, you can find him at the Muse Formation YouTube channel. And he's also an author, entrepreneur, and he's got some of the best advice out there for artists trying to break through in the streaming era. We've got Finn McKenty from Punk Rock MBA, which is a huge YouTube channel. He's also one of my partners at URM, and he's just a marketing genius. And we've got Logan Young, who is an independent artist who is getting over a million uh, monthly listeners on Spotify, over 10 million streams on his last track. And he is also a marketing wizard and an influencer and a sick guitar player. If you want to know more about him, just go to his Instagram and watch his videos. Like he's creative and he's really fucking good and he knows what he's doing with the marketing. So without further ado, let's get into this. Welcome guys. Hi there. Hello. Thank hey. you for having me. Yeah. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. So uh, what do you guys think when you see artists posting that uh, the system is stacked against them, that Spotify does everything to fuck artists, that Facebook is out to get them and won't show their posts to anybody, and that basically they can't get anywhere unless they spend a lot of money or get born into the right family, and that there's basically no point in even trying. I agree. Stop trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's accurate. But someone said it finally. Uh, I will start by saying I every week do a stream where I show how artists are breaking right now mm -hmm. and do a different one every week. So I watch with solid proof. I go in, I dissect exactly what they did do and i what you see is the artists who are breaking are often spending almost no money on content many 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 of them the video even they break with is like a terrible video the most viral song in the world uh the last month was that dasha uh austin video which she released independently at first that video could have been filmed on an iphone and had the worst most cliche film grain probably ever in the world it, it, there's no truth that you need to be spending money on ads. Most of the artists who break don't spend any money on ads. And there's no truth that the algorithm is stacked against them. Uh, you're just not doing the research to learn what to do to get the algorithm to like you. I think that's accurate. And as a point of like backing you up, Spirit Box's first video, um, Holy Roller, I think they spent $500 on that. And Spirit Box are probably some of the smartest marketers we've yes. seen in the last decade. Absolutely. But yeah, point being they didn't, you know, they didn't spend fifty thousand dollars on a video and then fifty thousand dollars on Facebook ads or something. They spent five hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's so many examples of this from every genre of music and creators everywhere. Mm -hmm. and you know, I, I, I understand how fr that we know that it's not true, but I understand how frustrating it is. I mean, when I started my YouTube channel, you guys, you know, the three of you remember, I mean, I, I even though there, I had some people who knew I was from some other things I had done, I got 150 views or something for the first like six months or something like that. I mean, it's, it's hard, it's tough and it does feel like the deck is stacked against you, but that is only true if you let it be true. You know, if, if you just keep smashing into that wall enough times eventually it's going to crack and you're going to get through i think you just can't let yourself think that it's that you're doomed because that will become a self-fulfilling prophecy i guess the question is how much time should it take and i guess that's what's really hard for people because you hear so many stories from successful artists where in any type of art like it happens with uh, actors too where they were ready to quit you know, they put in 10 years and 
basically the opportunity came up a month before they were like ready to move away and go to the real world. I mean, th that's a little bit dramatic, but when, when to give it up is really tough because you hear all these stories about um, people's career starting to turn around right as they were about to give up. So how do you know when to hang it up and when to keep going? Look, I'm curious what your thoughts are that on when to quit and when to not. Yeah. So, um, I guess with all of us, like Finn, Jesse, I'm sure when you guys started posting videos, nothing really blew up right away or in the beginning, it's the same thing with the spirit box example. That wasn't their very first video. That was the first video that really blew up. Ha -ha, for them. Geez, shows what I know. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> You know, they were a band for like, I don't know, three, three years, two years before that point. But they were super consistent. I think that's the thing that makes uh, artists actually break out um, and makes content creators and anyone who's trying to get that brand awareness out there. That really is the key is to be consistent. That's that's what I did when I started too. Um, you know, I was we talked about this on the last time we got together, but you know, in the beginning, I was posting like once a week, once every two weeks. And like today's world, that doesn't cut it. Like yep. it's you don't necessarily have to do it every single day. That would help. But, you know, five times a week, four times a week, it's got to be really consistent, especially when nobody's heard your stuff. Nobody's seen your face. The more times people see your face and hear your music and you, you just get stuck in there and they'll see you again. And they'll be like, oh, wait, I remember this guy. <laughs> I would say like as just sort of a a rough guideline, if you've been doing literally the same thing for like maybe six months and you aren't seeing any growth, then something is wrong. Like it, it, it could be going from 100 views to 200 views to 300 views, like 300 views still is probably not what you're looking for, but that's 3x where you were a few months ago. So you got to just sort of have some perspective on, are you seeing growth? And if you're not seeing any growth at all, like if it's still a hundred views of video after six months, you probably need to re rethink something. But if you are seeing some positive momentum, then you are making progress. And, you know, if you look at any graph of just about anything, you know, like typically in the very beginning, it's small, 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 small. And then that's when things start getting really big, you know, and because it's percentage, you know, it's it's the base rate effect. A 10% increase over a small number is another small number. A 10% increase on a big number is a big number. So I would focus on the percentage increases rather than the absolute numbers. We actually have a perfect example of this, like Finn and I do. Um, so we've been focusing on socials a lot at URM and Riff Hard for like the past, I'd say in different in different areas of focus for over a year now. One of the first things that we focused on was building Joel Wanasek's uh, socials, one, one of our partners. And um, so it started with his YouTube channel and his Instagram. And in all honesty, it was pretty slow. Like he was in the 3000 view prison on Instagram for a long time, well over a year. The YouTube still hasn't quite hit, but... Uh, few months ago we had a, a meeting about something's not right here exactly what finn just said something isn't right here like it was posting too often too consistently the content's good what is wrong like what what is it and we tweaked a few things and he's had several vo videos now going to six figures worth of views on instagram it was the change mm -hmm. was dramatic and it was quick it was literally like the next week after we made that change but i think that it's it was quick except for the six months where it wasn't quick more like a year more like a year yeah, but yeah. yeah. well it was quick once we made the change but that's just right. to illustrate that that's kind of how it seems to go for a lot of people is a period of nothing a tweak yep. and then a lot yeah. more so and, when should you give up? I mean, I think that's just a question everyone has to ask, answer for themselves as far as, you know, what life do you want? What, you know, like, are you cool with being broke for another year? Do you have a family? What do you like? What do you want to do with yourself? I mean, that's sort of up to you. But I remember for me, I, I, I remember 
when I was feeling really discouraged in the beginning of YouTube, where I felt like it just wasn't happening. Um, I watched a video by I Justine. I don't know if you guys remember her from like years ago. She had that viral like iPhone bill video from like 2008 or something like that. She got like an 800 page bill for her iPhone. And so she's been making YouTube videos for like 15 years. And she said, you know, if you just keep going, you'll you'll only fail if you quit. And I was like, I'm just literally going to keep doing this until it works. <laughs> and uh, and it did. And it was discouraging. But I just said, I'm not going to quit until I make it work. What One of the big things when you guys talk about small tweaks, I think people really, really underestimate is I think a lot of people are ignorant to that algorithms often don't even know where to put you. One of the big things, one of the funniest things I see is I'll go on somebody I'm doing a consult with TikTok and they're like, I'm in algorithmic jail. I'm only getting 200 views. And I look at who they're following and interacting with. And they're interacting with Cousin Tony, who uh, shows his autographed hockey jerseys, and they're making Nightcore remixes. So then <laughs> we get them to follow a bunch of Nightcore nerds, a bunch of accounts. They comment, they reply, they do videos, they do other tagging, they stitch, they do it. All of a sudden, mm. unfollowing Cousin Tony and following them on another account, an algorithm knows what to do with them. And this good content that they've been doing is it. There's a lot of people that it's just one or two tweaks away sometimes. It's also just the content. Like one of the main fixes I just did the other week that really blew somebody up. They were, you know, a thing I identify with very much. Don't like looking at themselves on camera. We zoomed it on their face more that was the only tweak we did. Next five videos, all those videos started tripling, 10xing, all this stuff because they were really out of focus all the time. Mm -hmm. And no one could connect with really honest music when they're being filmed far away in a forest, but a little closer. Yes, the forest is a little less pretty, but you can see their face and the emotion in it. That's the only tweak. It's amazing. That was the only, the only tweak was literally bringing the camera about three to five feet closer. That's, that's great. I mean, that's kind of kind of what i've noticed um with the joel thing too is that the tweaks were not major it wasn't like change subject matters completely or anything like that um i think though kind of what finn is saying that if there's no growth then you need to uh ask yourself what you're doing wrong i think for instance in joel's case there were people watching it just wasn't that many but there were people watching and they were generally being positive about it. So I felt like there was some evidence there that it's got some potential. Um, and I think, I think it's important to be looking for evidence, like evidence. Do people like, like, so that you answer for yourself, do I just totally suck? Like, do I have no business doing like this music thing? Um, or whatever it is, this YouTube thing or both, do I have no business doing this? Or has it just not caught on yet? And I think that when you, if it's it just has not caught on yet, you need to look for evidence, um, and not just numbers. I think not just numbers, but also are you getting response from strangers? Uh, do you have any indicators in the world that there's at least some people out there who value what you do? Because if there's some people, that means there can be more. There definitely can be more. If they're strangers, if you don't know them, if they're not your friends and you're not and they're not your family, that's some very strong evidence that if you just do some things differently, you can multiply that number. But you gotta look for that evidence, I think, and be honest. Yeah. If if you can get ten people to like your shit, then you can get a hundred people to like your shit. And if you can get a hundred people to like your shit, you can get a thousand and it just keeps going and going and going. Really, a lot of time is finding in the the right audience for it, and so many people d don't realize that they're being served to a terrible audience. How did That's you find true. it, Logan? I'm, I'm I, curious uh... about that because you do you do stuff, especially on Instagram. That's where I see most of your stuff. Like it's very engaging, but it's also not like you're not doing the stuff that I typically see getting like all the views. Like you're not playing some insane shred thing you're not doing like guitar acrobatics like you're not a hot girl like it's it's like <laughs> all you you kind of do your own thing i uh i did that on purpose 
it's made it a longer grind to get the numbers because I didn't really go after the trends or what other people were doing. I definitely took inspiration from other people, but I think uh, kind of paving my own way with my own little spot in the way that I do things um, made me stand out. But uh, it was definitely harder to break out to more people because I wasn't really pandering to what the wider audience is looking for. Um, but it makes it more worth it. You know, the slow growth to then when you finally get to those bigger numbers, like you have people who actually genuinely really care about what you're doing. Um, so I think that that can sometimes be a lot more important. What did you do specifically to differentiate yourself? Uh, well, I feel like I played to my strengths, so I'm definitely not a shredder. That is not who I am. Uh, I actually don't even really like shred music a little bit, but it's not really the main thing that I enjoy. I, I like songwriting um, and I like, I love metal music a lot um, and I love blending it with different genres and I love kind of bringing two worlds together and bringing two fan bases together. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I think experimenting, especially in the beginning is super important. Um, something that ended up making my stuff kind of pop off a lot more was experimenting and, uh, making little optimizations along the way. So kind of like what you guys are talking about with zooming in on the face more, um, you know, when I first started making videos, it was my face wasn't in it at all. It was just my guitar. And I read somewhere, you know, if you see somebody, somebody sees like a face in a post that they connect to it more. And I was like, well, I'm willing to try it. And once I started doing that, I started getting a lot more views. And then, you know, more things like that along the way where, you know, before it would just be right into the video, just playing. Um, and then I started experimenting well with, uh, you know, adding hooks at the beginning. Um, you know, sometimes I'll do like gent plus dubstep or something along those lines. Right. And I'll, I'll put that in the beginning. So it'll have like the intro clip going, it'll have the text, big text on the screen that kind of comes in and you see some weird looking Jesus guy <laughs> with the guitar and you're like, all right, what? what the heck is gent dubstep going to sound like? You know, just that kind of thing. It kind of catches people's attention. Um, so adding something like that uh, has helped quite a bit. And it's like never really letting go of that. You know, it's good to, in the beginning, especially experiment a lot. But when you find the things that work, like really double down on them. But they don't last forever. The things that worked a year ago do not work anymore. You know, it's always changing. So that's why you got to stay kind of fluid with the content that you're making and continuing to be open to um, changing it up, trying different things. You said a couple things there that I thought were interesting that, and, and I would like to highlight. Number one is that you were willing to do things that the audience responds to, because the thing that I've think that I've seen from a lot of musicians is like, it's a really weird thing where they're like desperate for attention and yet they're also terrified of attention and they won't do the things that get attention. Like they don't want to show their face, but they all want everyone to pay attention to them. Yeah. <laughs> and I get that because like, I fucking hate the way my face looks and I hate the way my voice sounds <laughs> as much as anybody on this planet. But, you know, I'm willing to do what it takes to get people to pay attention because that's my job. And so I, I find that, I don't know, it's just a really interesting thing of that, that with musicians, especially metal musicians, they're like very <laughs> desperate for attention, but they don't want attention at the same time. Does that make sense? And they're unwilling to do the things that would change that. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yes. Totally. It is like that. I think there's a conflict in a lot of creators that they, um, when you do artist development with people, one of the things I think is always interesting is, is like some things people are not willing to compromise. Uh, and uh, I think that one of the things people don't realize though, is that like a lot of the compromises can be just like what you're willing to do. Like, so a good example is what most people really don't get. And I worked at a major label. I witnessed this is that 
there is a church and state like wall often from the a and r and the marketing people think everybody's thinking about the marketing mm-hmm. before the song and yes there's increased parts of like rap songs and pop songs where that leaks in but in a lot of the genres you literally talk to an a and r and when you've handed in the product is the first time you're going to talk to that uh project product manager and they will, they will not have intersected at all and I think some of the things people forget is that you can be uncompromising in your art portion of this and compromising in the delivery of the art. And that's really what I think does it really break your heart that you like the biggest thing I see all the time. I can't believe I have to make my song just the hook of the song for people to listen to it these days. Yes, poor you. You Somebody's only going to hear a little of your song instead of none of it. Well, I, I mean, it's 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 an interesting thing. I think that um, musicians, in particular, I don't think this is true of creators so much because I think creators just sort of have accepted that this is just the way it is that you got to make what people want. But musicians like really struggle with the idea that you can't force the audience to consume your music in the exact way that you want them to consume it. But that's just how it is. Just like how some directors, you know, of movies hate it when you turn on like change the color settings on your TV. It's like, well, I don't know what to tell you, man. People have remote controls now. If they want to change the color, they're going to change it. Just be happy they're listening to or they're watching your movie at all. Yeah, I remember before the new Mission Impossible came out last summer, I think Tom Cruise and the director had like a five minute video on how to properly set your TV to like get rid of the motion smoothing, (laughs) which you know what though? I agree with them. The motion smoothing makes movies look like shit, but totally they gave a tutorial. They gave a tutorial. If if, listen, (laughs) if dad wants to watch mission impossible with motion smoothing on, sure. What are you going to do? You know, but you're right. It is. It's hilarious though. Watching them give a tutorial on, on motion smoothing. Uh, I think, metal bands especially do have a hard time separating the delivery of the art from the art itself and uh and i do think that it it's in part to do with what you just said finn about them being afraid of attention but i think they're also afraid of what other people will say about them in the scene so they're afraid of they want to get known but they're afraid of what this mean minority in the scene will say about them on the Which internet. Which they will say. They will but say. Who gives a fuck? No matter what you do, they will no say. Matter, yeah. the, no matter what, if you do anything online, people are going to talk shit. Anything. The only way to be safe from criticism is to do literally nothing. So just do whatever the fuck you want to do. That's the only path. And realizing that a lot of that criticism is what you will be built on. I'm in the middle of the two of the worst days I've ever had of comments on my YouTube channel because I criticize someone and I'm getting, to be honest, the most concussed comments I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> but I, what I also like they're know, mad though, at you for the crit. They're mad at the delivery of the crit. They're mad. I I used an actor to get around copywriting, and they're all saying that this was the worst thing I've ever done in the world because I didn't want my Whatever. video to get copyright yeah. stricken. Um, and but the point being, the real fact of the matter is, is like one of the most defining things as an artist is what is your callus? You know, when you yep. see the Doja Cats, the Lizzo's melting down, quitting music, it's yep. like. It does actually benefit them because people talk about them. And the real fact of the matter is, as long as the talk isn't Kanye level, you're a Nazi, it usually does benefit you. Kanye is a piece of shit, but guess what? He went to number one on Billboard even when he was literally praising Hitler, which is really unfortunate. But my point is that like, even in that like super extreme example, which I wish he wouldn't have brought up because that just sort of opens a whole can of worms that muddies the waters. But, um, it doesn't fucking matter at all. If people on Reddit don't like you and talk shit about your band, it doesn't fucking matter at all. Every band you can think of, people on Reddit and whatever are talking shit about them. It does not fucking matter. Like Lorna Shore is a perfect example of this. They were Reddit's favorite band, you know, in 2020 and 2021 when they were like still kind of smaller. And then after they blew up, everyone was cheering for them for like, three months and then 
the table turned and now everyone fucking hates them and they're sold out and they suck and all their songs sound the same, blah, blah, blah. Guess what? They're making more money than ever. And they're playing to more people than ever. They're getting more streams than ever. So who gives a shit? Do whatever you want to do. Well, I think it's a gauge. The internet rage is a gauge, I think. I don't know if there's like an exact equation for a ratio of if you have X amount of people talking shit, then there's this many people who actually love your stuff who don't comment anywhere. They just consume it. Um, I think there's there's some like rough equation that yeah. could work for most cases to show that, I think. Social, I, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, um, I do think it is important, not to, like obviously there's, like I'll get comments that are like, you know, it's just me playing guitar and someone's like, oh, this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life, like die. And I'm like, all right, this is wild. <laughs> but uh, I do think it is important to kind of track the feedback that you're getting. I mean, that's like, I'm kind of what I've turned my entire Instagram into is like, it's basically an archive of ideas and sometimes they work and sometimes yeah. they totally don't. And um, it's good to kind of put feelers out there um, so that I know if, you know, is this idea worth turning into a full song or, you know, it's happened many times where I've like really believed in an idea and I'm like, all right, I'm going to put it out there. And people are like, eh, no, man, this ain't it. And I'm like, oh, geez, so I need to go back to the drawing board or like ideas that are throwaways to me that I, I put out there and, and like everybody. But, but you loves don't let it. it stop you from even trying. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. That's yeah. the important part. You still try. And if people don't like it, all right. Well, I guess that one was a miss. But you still try. It is it is important to like I said, experiment, try things. If it doesn't work, listen to the people, you know, listen to what your fans have to say viewers have to say about it i mean obviously obviously if it's just nonsense and they're just being hateful then you can ignore that that's always going to happen but you know like your core fans are, are are a great way to kind of gauge which direction to go with something well i, think I mean how it's many important times to does differentiate. Metallica sorry i was just say it's important to differentiate though between um haters just yeah doing the hate train versus your actual audience not liking the new thing you did and sending you signals that you should probably read like when some out band will put out some weird album that kind of sucks and their core fan base lets them know but uh it doesn't abandon them it that's a different that's different than like the reddit hate train i think it's important yeah. to be able to differentiate between the two uh one of the things i was gonna say too is uh social psychologist jonathan Haidt wrote a book called the and one of the things he proved in this too is that when you get people strongly opinioned about you it usually creates almost an equal response of defense to proportion to what people measure as the if this is not just baseline hating, like if it's just like, eh, I don't care, that doesn't respire too much of a thing. But if this is the worst thing in the world, somebody doesn't like, say, as you said, dubstep gent being combined, they think they should be segregated, that will inspire a huge, huge response. I mean, I I think of a very funny thing of this, because I had read that book at the time, it was the one of the last time we were all together, uh, was at the URM Academy, and I made a joke uh, summit, and I made a joke about uh, pineapple pizza. And all day, people had felt the need to strongly defend or strongly do. And this is also why you see, generally, elections are not very, uh, uh, are usually very tight because people do alignments almost in proportion to both sides. And usually a strong backlash on one side inspires a very equal proportional one on the other side. Well, I'm still waiting for the army to rally in my defense then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. I defend you as the uh, historian of heavy music all the time, Fed. Come on. Appreciate it. Thank you. But I mean, you have the viewers though, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down to is for me anyway. Um, I mean, I made the most money in my life last year and people talked more shit about me last year than ever. 
There you go. I don't think those two things are, I don't think that's a coincidence. No. No, it's not. But that that is what happens when you uh when you're making big moves, you know? You're in front of more people. There's gonna be more people to slam you down or try to, you know. It is what it is. And you know, it's uh, uh, metal, it's just so interesting to me that metal is like such aggressive music and that so much of the message is about, you know, whatever, rejecting, you know, rejecting society, but yet at the same time, they're so intensely afraid of judgment. And I uh, and and that's I think part of what makes metal bands sort of afraid to do the things, getting back to the topic of the discussion here, like afraid to do things that are gonna make them break out. Um and I guess the thing I would say to them is like, don't let these people have power over you. Like they want to hold you back and they want to make you invisible. Don't fucking let them make you invisible. That's what they want is for you to, for them to control you. And they want to like squish you down. Don't fucking let them. A, a great example of this. I cite a lot that most people will never see is. So I produce a lot of podcasts a lot of different ones. And one of the funniest things you can see on Apple podcasts is people go on and they use their reviews to say what they want you to do. And they'll tell you, well, I'm not listening anymore all the time unless you do this thing because they want to control you. And then here's the funny thing. Apple will not let you do a second review. You have to update your new review. So then six months later, that same person updates their review. So I can clearly see they're still listening as they complain about a new thing again. And so you see right there of that, a lot of people's complaints are they want to bend their will to a thing they like, but these complaints don't necessarily mean they're going to abandon you as a creator because they probably already liked you for a reason. I was mentioning Metallica earlier because for a solid probably, what, 20 years, like people did nothing but talk shit about Metallica, right? Because they did Load and Reload and then they did St. Anger and the movie and all this stuff. And people just talk shit, talk shit, talk shit. Did that hurt Metallica's career at all? I think they were doing just fine. Yeah, they've they've been steamrolling the entire time. Right. S second most streamed metal band last year. Who was number one? Sleep Token. Amazingly beat them. Wow. Wow. That's that, a and that record came out late in the year, too. Good like, job. It's crazy. But that record... You can see uh, repeat listens on records now with uh, chart metric, and that record oh. has a score that I have rarely seen beat by. Like, if you listen to it, you listen to it a million times. Um, the only artist I've seen that's as new as them beat it is uh, Yeet. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. Oh, well, congrats to Sleep Token. But uh, I, I think that the uh, the Metallica example is a great example. Because if you think about also throughout their career, uh, they've taken a lot of risks. Like they have yep. been fearless about yep. what they've done. They have put some stuff out that like it hurts my soul to watch because it's so painful. Like that some kind of monster yeah. movie was like, wow, I cannot. The balls it takes to show the world that you like that and then or that Lulu like you think album. lars didn't realize he came off like a douchebag in that of course he knows of course he knows but he put it out anyway and i think that's amazing yeah i i one of the funniest things i think about with metallica too is like you know a lot of people will be like oh an artist's just ahead of their time and it's like yeah okay sure whatever you say but the do you guys know this band south arcade i do because of you no. i think oh I, that's right i sent it to you mm -hmm. on text the other night uh south arcade who are phenomenal, probably one of the most fastest growing bands in heavy music, uh, super unique sound. They use the St. Anger sample on their big oh. song. And <clears throat> I, and like, too, when I hear Knocked Loose, I'm like, it's kind of a St. Anger snare yeah. going on here. <laughs> it totally and, is, yeah. Yeah, and like, you're like, okay, that was considered the worst career taste decision in the history of music that year. Like, it was the only thing nerds like us talked about. Yep, And like in the past year, the the worm has turned and now everyone loves saint anger that happens so much with things though it'll be hated like 20 years ago and then now everyone will yep. just love it <laughs> Limp biscuit probably my favorite example of this mm -hmm. Limp biscuit yeah. the most hated band on the planet and now you're not going to find a single person that has anything negative to say about them it's crazy yeah, because the hate for those two things 
Saint Anger and Limp Biscuit were not they weren't like passing hate. They were very, very deep, like deep and passionately felt almost universal hatreds. Like For that's years. just what people thought. Like the Saint Anger snare, hating it is just what people thought. That it's just how they felt about it. And like thinking Limp Biscuit sucked or hating Fred Durst was just how people were. It, it wasn't, there weren't even like two contingents really. It was, it definitely wasn't that polarization thing that you were talking about earlier, Jesse. It was like 99 1 or something. I, I, what was interesting though is because I, I think what it is is often there's a cultural barrier. You would have so many people. I mean, you look at Woodstock 99, how many people were interested. They were still pretty big. I mean, this is a band I know very intimately, obviously, from working with them. And, you know, I really see the tide in that, like, you know, if you were talking to an every man, a lot of them still thought Nookie slap. But like, I would tell people I work with Lid Biscuit, and I'd get the literally the reply often would be why, which I would answer the Nookie duh. But uh, and now it would be the coolest thing in her yeah, discography. But, but no, in, in all honesty, now kids say to me, "I can't believe you worked with Lid Biscuit." It's like that's so cool. Yep. So my message to take away from all this is like. For anybody listening to this that feels like the deck is stacked against them, that's only true if you let it be true, and especially if you let like fear of judgment or fear of looking stupid or something hold you back. Like, what would Metallica do? What would Limp Bizkit do? They would do whatever the fuck they want. That is a hundred percent the case. Totally. All right. So I want to take. I want to spend a little bit of time on uh, one thing. I want to basically hear from the three of you and I'll give my opinion on what are three things that you're noticing that now work for artists uh, it, to give them disproportionate boosts. Um, like what are, I w don't want to say cheat codes because there aren't really any cheat codes, but I guess what would be the three things that you see working now that would be the closest thing to a cheat code for like, getting your streams up or like getting your name out there or whatever jesse first uh one take advantage of that we're in the earworm era of music promotion in that on tiktok reels and youtube shorts and i want to emphasize that all three are equal right now that you could, I, I no one sees more new artist data of how they're breaking than me probably in the entire business right now all three of those could be your ticket out of could be your ticket out of obscurity, uh, with a nearly equal chance. Um, but putting your hook in the song and repeating it numerous times, thirty to sixty videos over two months, is the most common way. One of the main things I see all the time now is when artist songs start to do well, they may re have released another song. They have to keep promoting that one and just forget about that song and let it kind of. <clears throat> fall under uh, the tire for a little while and they're going to roll over it with the bus uh to the consistency of doing eventful things for a long period of time almost everyone i analyze there's a rare case like a good neighbors who like the first song does something but usually it is people who've been making content for two years on a very regular basis and start to understand that there is a small language inside that content that you get much much better at and you start to see tiny little things that matter just the same way that when you were 14 you couldn't hear the difference of the picking of a good guitarist and a bad guitarist you couldn't hear the difference of the gain you get that with content uh as well and then three really just connecting with as many people and understanding your community because who the artists that you're associated with that you're on playlists with the artists that you're on um getting tagged with by listeners those are going to determine your algorithm and what most people don't know is i'm sure ayala is seeing this right now as his record's blowing up the majority of your streams from new listeners are going to be from algorithmic playlists so you need to be connected to those algorithm uh to other artists that are likely to be connected to you in an algorithm Logan. So, um, what Jesse just said about the, um, the like 60 
posts about um, their song after it comes out. I actually just in real time saw this happen um, with a friend of mine. Um, her name's Haley. She put out a, a brand new band from scratch, one song. They've got a second one out now, but they uh, put that song out and they did exactly what Jesse said. They over and over days, months, like I think it took them about three months or so of just like every day, new video, new idea. A lot of them didn't do very well, but it only takes one or two to do very well. Um, and being a completely new band, they're called Gore, by the way, being a completely new band. Um, I think they've got that song's got like 600,000 or something, which is wild for uh, like a metalcore band that no one's ever heard of that just started. Um, so that tactic has really been working. Um, TikTok in general, um, I mean, that's how my one of my songs blew up. It's coming up to almost 10 million streams now. Um, I didn't do that approach where I posted that song every day. It actually blew up later. I put that song out last April, so it's been a little over a year. And you know, upon release, it was okay, you know, did well. I think between April to December, that song got about 2 million. So decently performing on its own. And then um, me and the guy I collabed with, you know, we just made a couple posts about it here and there. And uh, also in, in the meantime, th the entire time in the background, I had these evergreen ads running. Not a lot of budget, just a little bit of money to just keep people going there, keep it moving in the background while I was putting out more music. And uh, TikTok, attractive girls on TikTok found it. And that's like, that's the way now. That's the magic <laughs> ingredient. So, you know, Get and the that's, baddies. yeah, that's snowballed. So, you know, December to now you know, two, two million to almost 10 million now. And it was just more like every time I look, it's just more and more videos. Um, and I think that that comes from, you know, that you have a song that old doesn't mean like it's, it's new to somebody at some point, right? Like doesn't matter that it's old to you and you put it out a year ago, it's new to somebody. So I think having like that constant promotion and I'm, I'm a big fan of having a blended approach where you have your organic content that you push really hard, but oh, you also have ads in the background that kind of, you know, you don't know what's going to happen with the algorithm, right? You could post and it could just suck. But if you have a blended approach where you're not completely relying on one thing, that's the, it would be the same thing in reverse with you don't post any organic content, but you just run ads. It's bad to just rely on one thing. And it's the same thing with a, a platform too. You should post as many places as you possibly can, especially because the audiences are different um, on each platform. So I think having a blended approach is, especially now, super valuable because a lot of people hang out in different places. They're going to see things at different times. Um, and I'd say probably the most important thing um, that has, you know, elevated my, I, I wouldn't even call it a career. I like, I have a day job. I just do this stuff for fun. Um, <laughs> so music, what elevated it to, you know, being almost uh, a million monthly now, uh, as a solo independent metal artist, um, was collabing with other artists. And that was kind of what I based the whole project on was collaborations. And that's doing main artist collabs with um, pretty much anyone I could who was, you know, similar in size or that actually didn't even matter if they were similar in size. Just anyone that was similar in sound or, you know, wanted to do a track that our audiences together made sense. Like there was a little bit of overlap, but still a, enough of a gap that we could benefit from making music together collabs has by far been the best way to to grow and i know al you you were talking to me the other day about you know you've been releasing a yeah. couple tracks that are collabs and you've not just a couple a huge yeah a huge difference and it's 
Uh, it's why it's the way and metal musicians are so afraid. Uh, like every other genre is so down. They're like, yeah, come mm -hmm. on. We're doing songs together, singles, whatever. Metal musicians are like, no, man, it's me. It's my album. You're going to listen to the whole thing. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, it doesn't got to be like that. headphones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ben, what are your three? Well, you guys covered so many good things um, that you took all my ideas that I never actually had. Um, I'll give you one, <laughs> which is um, personality. Um, and I'll give you a couple examples of that. One that Jesse mentioned is Yeet. If you're not familiar, he's a rapper who's weird as fuck. Like his whole thing is he always wears these like um, scarves and he has like his whole his own like like language like slang that he developed and like and he always he is always referencing bells i don't know why he has just this whole like world around him and he like seems like just such a strange dude i don't know if it's all calculated or i don't know if he actually is a weirdo it doesn't really matter the point is like he's like very obviously different in terms of and it's not just like costumes it's all of that stuff um another example of that which everybody knows is sleep token um different in the sense of like and they're interesting because they don't have personalities meaning that like they don't do interviews and you know nobody you know people know who they are but they don't know who they are but their personality comes through with the visuals and the lore and it just comes through you know and another example i would say would be bill murray johnny frank um who's been making music for a long time but i feel like what really made him sort of like like turn the corner was when he really leaned into like be you know like he's a funny guy you know leaned into sort of the meme type stuff and sort of his like dad persona now that he has and stuff you know like with this video where he's on a lawnmower and stuff and you know that video cost literally zero dollars to make to your point jesse yeah. um and people fucking love him like people worship him and it's in number one he's a fantastically talented musician yeah but there's a lot of talented musicians out there. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever got is that it's not good enough. It, it's not enough to be good. You also have to be different. So personality, I think like all the tactics you guys mentioned are like great. Personality is just going to multiply the effectiveness of any of these things that you do. Like you can do all the tactics, right? But if the raw materials aren't there, meaning music that's not different and personalities that aren't different, it isn't going to work. Because the world is full of, you know, undifferentiated content of all kinds. And, you know, like it or not, music is content now, right? Like, if you think about, really, you, you should be asking yourself, why would somebody be listening to my music right now versus the other things they could be doing? They could be playing video games or watching Netflix or scrolling TikToks, or they could be on OnlyFans or, you know, the, the other 9 million things they could be doing with their time what is different and entertaining about what I'm doing. And so I think personality is just basically a multiplier on top of all these different tactics you guys mentioned. Totally. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my three were kind of covered. So I'll just elaborate on a couple things and I'll give one that is kind of, if everything here was kind of like going from one to 100, I think there's a zero to one that uh that should be covered which is i've heard these words out of the mouths of people who want to have a project that people care about um but don't so right now a lot of what we were talking about was for projects where some people care and they want more people to care or a lot of people care and they want a lot more people to care but it, people who have projects where literally nobody cares and um, they're trying to get from nobody to somebody. But then I've heard words out of their mouths like, well, I don't want to be like some fucking influencer. Uh, so then basically don't. rejecting, rejecting, yeah. <laughs> getting into video. Uh, you have to just drop. You just have to drop the uh, that idea that anybody's imposing anything on you and trying to turn you into something you're not, you just need to like, just stop that line of thinking um, and understand that we're not in the nineties anymore. We're not in the early two thousands. The rules of the game 
have changed. And if you want to make music that people listen to, you have to just understand the environment we're in. And it doesn't mean you got to do stupid TikTok dances, yep. but it doesn't mean you have to, you know, sell your soul, but you have to work within the system that exists. Like the system was different once upon a time and people hated it back then too. Like it, you're never going to totally like it, but if you don't work with it, uh, no one's going to hear your shit straight up. Um, so to go to, from zero to one, I think people need to get over themselves, which kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier of doing whatever it takes and, you know, not like, you know, wanting attention and not wanting attention. It's kind of along those lines, but I think people do need to get over themselves. Um, the collabs, I think collabs are more powerful than playlists now. Um, at least, at least in my experience, because yes. <laughs> we've got in on some pretty big playlists. Like we got on the new metal one, uh, a few weeks ago and we were track five. So I know if you're in the first eight tracks, we got, the, we were on the cover of it too, the all new metal playlist. Like there was a can time. I, can I interject real quick huh? about the playlist? What's Cause up? I, I feel very strongly about the playlist. Because I used to do them. It was a big mistake that I used to make was submitting to playlists all the time, hoping to get on big playlists, getting on, you know, personal playlists that had, you know, 40,000 mm -hmm. people following. We Playlist should clarify, and, you're saying user, not editorial, you mean? Yes. Yeah. User. Um, and I would notice that you would get a huge spike while you're on it. And as soon as you get kicked, because they only last so long, right? You pay to be on it for 30 days, something like that. You get kicked off it. This still happens with editorial playlists too, where, for example, all new metal, you'll be on it. You'll get a ton of streams while you're on it. It'll drop down when you're off of it. Uh, playlisting is like the lowest uh, listener intent place that you can be for yep. a lot of music. Maybe not so much for... I don't know. I think video game music actually does pretty well in on playlisting. Oh, but yeah. for metal music in particular, what I've noticed is well, you got to think about the intent of the the listener, right? So you're putting on a playlist because you're probably doing errands, you're driving somewhere, cooking dinner, cleaning up, and it's kind of in the background, right? And so even if you hear something that you enjoy, you probably don't even have a chance to like pick up your phone and save it or you, by the time you go back to it later you're going to forget what it even was so i think people being obsessed with playlists it's it's such like a, a vanity metric um that actually doesn't really get you true listeners it helps a little uh, can, but can, it, can, but can it's I not actually like, push back not, on that? yeah I, yeah, I, yeah please. i think it helps so, i just don't think it's life changing yeah. well here's what i would argue is I think one of the biggest problems is that what everybody looks at is that dip, but what they don't always think about in it's the thing I've seen in data a million times is let's say you get on all new metal on a certain week and there's like four new artists who are starting to do pretty well there. You're probably going to get put on their Spotify radio. You're probably going to get linked to them algorithmically and other algorithmic playlists. And that with the way that lifts the tide overall over time because we have to remember you can like if somebody's let's say you're next to a song that ends up being pretty classic people really listen to it get into it for years you will have years of growth off of being next to that song if you're who's in it next to spotify radio and often that happened because of the playlist and i think that that's the downstream effect that i think people underestimate how much just being on those editorials racks up the numbers for your algorithmic connections and does a very very big effect in the long term so i yeah. i guess where i was going with it was i think i do think playlists are good we've gotten a lot of uh, mileage out of them however i have experience with logan is talking about and i don't yeah. think that it's the be all end all for spotify which is kind of my that's kind of my main point is i think that it has shifted um, it used to be the be all end all. Now it's just one of many things you have to do. And I think that the thing that is the be all end all are the right collabs that has, um, nothing's given me 
more mileage than the right collabs. That's the gift that just keeps on giving. The the curve on that, on the right ones, it's it's so like it's so gradual the drop off. Um, if there is even a drop off. Like so I think artists doing collabs is the smartest thing. And I think, yeah, like you said, with metal, people are really weird about it, but that's they makes are, it better yeah. for those of us who aren't weird about it. I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier too. Like I feel strongly about playlists. I'm not uh, like no playlists ever. I think it goes back to what I was saying, blended approach. You can't have all your eggs in one basket, especially with playlists. Um, I do see what you're saying and th that value that it brings. And that is true. You can also, you know, make your own playlist too that, you know, you can control. I've had a lot of success with that. Um, collabs too. The lovely thing about collabs is um, it really incentiv incentivizes you to, you know, want the people that you work with to do well. It doesn't become a competition anymore because if somebody I did something with, you know, does well on another song that I'm not a part of, well, that actually helps me too, or, you know, vice versa. If I do really well on a, a, a song with somebody else, that song that I did with another person that's in my catalog, that's going to be uplifted by the success of something else. So everybody doing these songs together, we all want each other to do well together because we all win from it. Yep. Yep. And the other thing I think people really don't see, because a lot of people aren't looking at long data, is artist page visibility is one of the most insane, probably uh, until TikTok was the most consequential marketing thing that has ever occurred. And what I mean by that is when somebody loves a song and they're like, man, this is great. They go and they look at that artist and they see the name of the people they worked with and they do investigate it. We see it in data all the time. And that is just the album liner notes of the present day right now. And it is, you know, it's basically buying real estate on an artist that if they do well and they keep growing, you basically made an amazing investment in some great real estate. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing where I've noticed a lot of people fucking up is uh and this you know i know that this has to do with playlists because you can only submit uh once every so often to be considered for it or one song at a time one song but, every 28 days yep. only one song at a time yep exactly uh it, but i've noticed people do releasing songs like once a week uh and it's different if you're a huge artist but if you're an artist that's trying to build um not only is that bad for the algorithm, it's also bad for listeners. Um, you need to kind of respect that if they're building a relationship with you, uh, I don't think that uh, overflowing or overloading them with a bunch of music uh, in a very short period of time is necessarily a way to go because I just think about my fan journey um, you know, I'll hear about an artist and I'll ignore him and then I'll hear about it again and I'll ignore it. And maybe it'll come up on a playlist and maybe I will or won't listen. And then someone else will mention it and then it'll be like next on YouTube and then I'll check it out and be like, all right, that's kind of cool. Uh, but I'll only listen to like a minute of the song and then someone else will mention it and then it'll come up on Spotify. And then that time for whatever reason, I'm into hearing it and then I won't save them and then it'll come up again and I'll be like, Oh yeah, I like that song that time I'll save it and then I'll forget about it. And then it'll come up again. If, and then that time I'll be like, I should probably check out who this band is. I mean, that happens over the course of a while. Um, and I, I see so many artists releasing, like they work really, really hard to make an album or an EP and that's all they have. And then they'll drop it like one song a week for like five weeks and then done lights out. I mean, that's just, that's just not going to work. Um, so I think, uh, respecting and understanding the way that people 
uh, develop a relationship with things that they like uh, makes a huge, huge difference. And it can make a difference quickly for people if they combine that with the uh, all the other things that we talked about. You know, um, the last thing I'll say is back in the old days, it wasn't that different. Uh, it was just through different different formats. So you'd see an artist in a magazine and ignore it. You'd, they, you'd see that they're on some tour and ignore it. They'd come on Headbangers Ball and you might check it out. Then you'd see them in a magazine again. You might check it out, but you saw them. Then someone mentions it in a conversation. And then next time it's on Headbangers Ball or whatever, or on your local metal radio, you actually listen to it. Or they happen to be opening up a tour and you get there a little bit earlier so that you can see them. And over the course of several months and seeing the name a bunch of times, you develop a relationship with them until you turn the corner. And that I don't think is different now. Like I think that it's still, the way that people start to like things is exactly the same way it's always been. It's just the the mediums in which it takes place have changed. But the human brain hasn't had the time to evolve. We're still exactly the same as we were in the 80s or 90s or 2000s. And so, you know, you're just using the, the you're using what works with humans um, with the tools that are relevant for the time period you're working in. Um, any thoughts, anybody, before we uh, end this? Uh, I will back you up and say that. I think it's like the similar thing. Like, uh, I can remember mastering engineer Alan Douchess always saying, like, there's nothing you can do in Pro Tools. Like, you can't name me one thing that you could do in Pro Tools that you couldn't do if you took enough time in 1998 before everyone had Pro Tools is every bit of music marketing. I was around working at record labels when none of there was no digital at all. It's all just changed to a different digital version of it. And if anything, you now have to do less than you ever have in the history of music. You do I mean, not, I think that, yeah, go ahead. I think that's true for content. Like, I mean, I started yeah. out making fanzines back in the mid nineties and the videos I make now are the same thing as the fanzines I made when I was 16 years old. But like you said, it's just way easier. I used to have to go to the post office after school and like mail shit to people halfway across the world, you know, that sent me $3 in a sweaty envelope. And now I can just, you know, be here in my spare bedroom and upload it, you know, from my phone. So I think all of this, like you just got to make the world notice you and don't take no for an answer and don't let anybody hold you back. That's what I think. Agreed. All right. Well, this is a good place to end it. Thanks guys. Really, really appreciate Dude. it. And uh, Logan, thanks for uh, pressing me to actually do this. Yeah, Logan, we, we Logan, this idea Logan came ago. to me with the idea. So thanks for, thanks the, for following up. Leader. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad we could put it together. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right, dudes have a good one.